Mark, I'd like you to uh, pick up if you could, and you might you might pass on this. Uh, you dropped a teaser in there towards the end. You said, paraphrase, what about the relationship, or what about what science might have contributed to monotheism and presumably to religion as we understand it today. Let me point us all to uh, an article by Peter Harrison, uh, who Mark mentioned a number of times, an article posted, I think, maybe a week or so ago on ABC Religion and Ethics. Uh, Peter Harrison is actually uh, a fellow of his caste, uh, but a globally eminent scholar on the history of science and the relationship between science and religion. Mm. His article uh, proposes the idea that when we talk about the history of religion and science, one of the things we have to take into account is how those concepts have changed so much. So let me go back to my uh, question about your teaser. How might monotheism have contributed to our understanding today of what religion is? Uh, sorry, how much science have contributed to our understanding today of what we mean by religion or maybe what we mean by Christianity? Thank you. And then we'll have some more questions. Thank you, Chris. I did mention that at the end. Uh, a lot of studies and books have been written supposing that, well, there's monotheism there, and we assume it's unchanging, and then we see monotheism strongly exhibited in a certain place and suddenly scientific achievements are made, so monotheism must have been the cause uh, and only worked one way. The reality is that monotheism expressions also change and the acceptance of it and reception in society have changed and been different. What's really not been done anywhere I can find is a significant study saying could science have helped to cause the present forms of monotheism and their acceptance. Um, and I'll, to, to keep my comments brief, I'll read a footnote. That I didn't read, though I had footnotes in the papers. I take my classes off because this is in font size nine. The fact that in most instances, with the probable exception of the classical era of Greek philosophy, monotheistic thought systems historically preceded the scientific developments with which they are linked, means that the focus has been put on the likely positive impact of monotheism on science. But a case for the progress in scientific thinking having a causative effect on the development of monotheism could also be made, though it would be a bit more difficult. In the case of Greek philosophical monotheism, it could be argued that it was the asking of questions of the natural world that caused a movement away from the dominant polytheism of the Greek culture and toward philosophical monotheism, because the order of what began to happen there almost seems reversed. The rise of Greek philosophical monotheistic thought in turn played a considerable role in easing the way to the acceptance of Christian monotheistic religion within late antiquity. And anyone that studied uh, early Christian apologetics realizes that one of the big aspects of played upon as early Christian thinkers tying into Greek thought and it was moving uh, in, in the direction they were going and this whole rationalistic way of thinking and seeing the world indeed sacralizing the world was, was very significant. Monotheism was long established in Hebrew thought, but fought a long battle among the Israelites for ultimate acceptance. The kind of questions the ancient Hebrews asked of the world around them, as for instance we find in Job 38 and 39, may well indicate that the interest in finding explanations for the natural order of things existed at least alongside of their commitment to monotheism. The ancient Hebrews asked questions of the natural world. They were curious, they wanted to know these things. Did that asking the questions also encourage the ultimate victory of monotheism over the ever-pressing demands of polytheism around them? If, mon if monotheism and natural science grew up together and shared many of the same critical individual thinkers, it is not unreasonable <coughs> to assume that the natural science has produced a context just as conductive to the continued growth and advancement of monotheism as vice versa. Ultimately, an argument for science playing a critical role in giving rise to monotheism would need to rely on some form of reverse causality, or perhaps self-causality. In other words, the drive to ask questions of and understand the workings of the natural world was so strong that it somehow gave rise to religious systems, or favored religious systems, that were conducted to precisely this enterprise. Such phenomena are not unheard of in biological evolution, and there's no reason to exclude it from the evolution of ideas. 
If the desire to understand the physical world is stronger than the need to have deities responsible for every person, place, and event, then perhaps this need or desire played a role in bringing monotheism to the fore, which in turn played a decisive role in the inevitable emergence of natural science. At the very least, the relationship between monotheistic belief and natural science is far more complex than we imagine. So I think a, a sketch would have to go in a direction like that, which is not to say to minimize monotheism, but to say that if science needed a fertile soil to do what it did, it certainly helps in monotheism if we have a context in which people are thinking rationally and superstition is being fought by natural science and the kind of question that takes place is a much more fertile soil to confess faith in one single intelligent creator being. But that might be kind of radical. Strikes, there's two things that struck me. Uh, as I was listening. One was that wonderful book, The Stargazers, where the, the scientists of the late 16th, early 17th century could talk to each other across nationalities because they had a common language yeah. Latin. And the other thing that strikes me is the, the interrelationship of apparently disparate data. You first get in the Nicene Creed the bring together of a doctrine of the Trinity from the diverse data of the scriptures, which then develops ultimately into systematic theology. And that maybe has a, a helpful model for the interrelationship of the data of empirical observation that you then bring into scientific laws. Yes, and some would say that the kind of thinking, the very specific logical pinning down this but not that, you know, three to, you know, Three divine persons, but not three gods, the Lord divine, and, and saying it this way and that way and back and forth was a kind of scientific way of thinking and specificity that came out of Neoplatonism, uh, which is very influential in, in the thinking behind the Athanasian Creed, for instance. So there, there are links there. It said, if we live in a tradition that's been influenced for 2,000 years plus by two great intellectual movements, monotheism in its various forms, and natural science, it's inevitable that there's going to be some interplay there. And instead of considering, obviously, if you have two great traditions, there's going to be some tension and competition, but I think more attention needs to be given to the how much they've actually worked together. On, on the thing of monotheism having a dependence of, on science of sorts, I heard someone say recently that the, the occurrence of miracles is dependent on an understanding of science. It's understanding of science, or definition of science. That, 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 yeah, the, the understanding the world works in a particular way and thinking of the world in a particular way. Otherwise, a miracle would just be magic or, or, or superstition. So that was, or perhaps that was just, nothing at all. Yeah. Because if a miracle is a violation of what should happen of natural yeah. law, then you have to have some natural, you have to have some understanding of, of what doesn't happen yeah. to, to point to when it happened. Yeah. But, yeah, but my actual question was, um, can you make some more comment about the Chinese science, uh, Chinese medicine, uh, you, are you saying that's not science as we understand it? I would not like to say that, make the judgment. I'm saying almost all historians of science put that in a different category. Um, and, and not just the Chinese, uh, what exists in Babylon, in Egypt, among the Incas, and so many ancient civilizations. Remarkable things were achieved, but there seemed to, there seemed to be no interconnection uh, of logic between them. There seemed to be no asking why things work the way they do, how one thing connects to another. It was simply, what do we have to understand to fix this broken bone? What do we have to understand to relieve this pressure from the brain? What do we have to understand to make sure this wall doesn't fall down or that this catapult works? And, um, and so I'm reluctant to say, and they were important, this kind of technological advanced was, was important for the rise of science, but it seemed to exist almost everywhere with those great civilizations in order to actually sustain large-scale cities and structures uh, and, and this kind of thing coming forward. But there was a certain point they, they really never went beyond or breached, and so what I'm saying is that uh, of all the historian science you look at, they make a division point there uh, and call that ancient science. And they talk about in the time of, of the classical Greek period in Athens, something different starts to happen. People start not just doing the calculations and doing the maths and doing the geometry and working out 
you know, the building and, and experience it. What do we do to make someone who's sick better? They start actually asking why it works and how it connects to other things and connecting it to their, their kind of philosophical thinking. And so there I'm not trying to I'm not trying to read something in and say I'm gonna draw a line here because it's convenient for my argument. It is convenient for my argument, but a line already seems to be drawn by historians of science for the reasons I summarized very briefly there. And that's not to diminish those achievements. They were incredible in many cases. We still can't quite understand work out how they did it. But they didn't seem to have actually done what we do in modern science and say, why does it work? How does it connect with this? And, and, and have that kind of undergirding discussion. It was just simply enough that it did. It's more like the modern person or you know, people my age saying to the kids, you know, I don't care how I got the VCR to work or how I get my phone on, just do it again. <laughs> no need to understand, I don't want to, just, just make, it, make it do it again and then I'm happy. And we're talking about whole societies that, okay, we don't know why this worked, but just we're happy that it did. You found a way, then that, that's fine. And so the focus was more on technology than on the fuller sense of what we call science. <coughs> but beginning with the classical Greek period, that began to change. Mark, thank you for that fascinating lecture. Uh, I've got a simple question, but I apologize in advance. <coughs> it might lead to another lecture as long as I'm given. My question is, we're witnessing in the world at the moment the rise of fake news, populism, religious fundamentalism, political fundamentalism. <coughs> What's going on in the world and how does that relate to what you just talked to us about? That's a lot of questions. I'm not sure we're witnessing the rise of fake news, political fundamentalism, religious fundamentalism. I think these things have always been there. What we're, what we're witnessing is the incredible success of these things uh, because of the ease of communicating these ideas. Uh, that are unfiltered with former formats. You didn't get something published unless you convince an editor or, or a committee to put it forward in a magazine or journal. Now you can just go on the web and put it out there. And also I think the desire of people to say, I don't understand it, I feel overwhelmed by all the knowledge of the world, just give me something simple. And we want to hear that all these people think they're so smart. They're not, they don't know. We, know. we never landed on the moon, this never happened. And this kind of thinking comes up. So I think it's always been there. What's different is the success it's having. And it does put things at threat. One of the things that people often say who advocate Western Christian traditions are responsible for the rise of science. We discount what happened to ancient Islam because it went on there in the golden year of Islam and it went for 400 years, but then it stopped. So obviously it wasn't, it didn't stick. Well, folks, we haven't made it 400 years yet quite since, you know, really the high point of the scientific revolution. If it all comes collapsing down, the future generations say, no, what they did really didn't count because it didn't stick. Uh, and what we're seeing, it could be a threat to that. If people no longer want to know those questions, if they want to recreate a polytheistic kind of world, an animistic kind of world, with all sorts of superstitious explanations, and fake news, and illogical ideas are the explanations they want to accept, and, and logic means nothing any longer, uh, the, the enterprise of science will collapse. There'll be individual practitioners in strange books, but we'll be speaking a language no one else understands is listening to. So there could be a fragility to this all, so don't assume that what we've achieved that's still going is eternal and will always keep going. Uh, I think people thought that in, under the Abbasids that this, this will go on forever, but the political situation changed. They got invaded, hardliners came in, they went in simple religious rule and authoritarian practice. The cooperation between Christians, Jews, and Muslims and others just gone off the window, and the whole thing collapsed in a heap, almost overnight. Uh, thank you for tonight, it's been very good. Um, you've argued that the connection between science and monotheism, but what my question is, current scientific discoveries are pointing more and more to the connectedness and the relationality of our world around us, uh, even down subatomic level. Yep. Um, do you think that that could possibly point to a new area of faith which is neither monotheistic or polytheistic, but Trinitarian and relational, which is the God who I believe is the creator God. The and, whole, and, yeah. and the creation reflects that. But you have to explain it to most people because most people say, well, that's three gods, three in one. But it's not, it's a relationality between the three that is a creative force. And anyway, if you could comment on that, please. There, there are actually a few whole books written on that topic and people making that argument. 
Uh, I, would, I would say Trinitarian is a form of monotheism. It's a special kind of monotheism. It is Trinit Christian Trinitarian thinking is a form of a, 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 a genuine form of monotheism. And the increasing understanding of that relationality and interrelatedness to everything, say, does play and say it fits the kind of worldview we have. It's not accidental that early Trinitarian thinkers actually looked for this and understood this. So they're having people writing about these things. In the longer version of this paper, one of the things I mentioned under what specifically might have been about Christianity that would have helped further this along in recent centuries, Trinitarian thinking is one of them. But first you have to explain Trinitarian thinking and then going beyond as follows on the Holy Spirit that most of us know and talk about this you know, the interconnectedness of all things, relationality, what it means, and how it's played a role in understanding stuff, and then you do get a whole other paper there. So we just talked about the obvious one that's easy to understand, incarnation and, and lifting up uh, the virtue uh, and the honor of the physical. But yes, there's, there's a lot there. There has been some work done in that area, and there are a few books out there about that. A couple of them are quite good. One is, I, 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 just, I found quite an intelligible actually, so I'm not quite think the person got lost in their, their definitions. So more work needs to be done to explain it and get this idea to where people can understand it. Uh, but in the last probably 10 or 15 years, there's been, there's been several people saying things like that and expressing that. Uh, but I wouldn't go so far as say Trinitarian thinking caused science, but the fact that Trinitarian thinkers uh, have been at the forefront of asking these kind of questions I think it's probably more than coincidental. And again, when science emerges, it goes in this direction. It's a case of science helping further a, a certain form of, of monotheism, Trinitarian monotheism, that says looking at God is relational, as in, in, in community with God's own self and the whole world and interconnected is, makes sense. And, and they kind of, those ideas tend to support one another without actually saying one caused the other. But then, of course, contrasts with both uh, the, the um Judaism and, and uh, it's it's different. I still think mono, I still think the best explanation is that mono, with monotheism in general did some very fundamental basic things. Uh, the specific Christian like something like the doctrine of Trinity, I think, gets to be some fine tuning and nuancing that when you look at the Christian contribution that comes in more fully in the last four or five centuries, helps further explain the, the strength of what went on there, but I don't think it's the only cause. Uh, that, and, and, and somehow debunks of others. Now, I don't want to get back to saying suddenly science evolves when Christianity kind of comes into a spore and takes off, because why not 2,000 years or, you know, ago? Why not at this time? Why not here or there? Or discount what happened in uh, the classical Greek era or in, in the Muslim gold era that was also very vital and significant and happened without specific Trinitarian thinking. And so that's why I try to focus on the monotheistic aspect. I did an earlier version of this study once in a conference in Tehran about 10 years ago at a Christian Islamic conference, and the Muslim scholars all got it. And the Christian scholars were very unhappy because they wanted to argue that the real science began about 1600. And if it's associated with anything, it was Christian thinking uh, and, 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 and not the other. Uh, whereas I think some of the Muslim scholars would have liked to thought that way in many years ago, but given the situation now, they, they weren't trying to argue that it was only us. They were just saying, say, don't forget the contribution that happened there, too, uh, that was quite apart from Christian influence, except from, of course, the Nestorian connection, which is often not known to them. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed uh, the idea of uh, recuperating uh, uh, broader strands of Christianity alongside other forms of uh, monotheism, of course, but. Uh, strands of Christianity uh, as uh, contributors to uh, the rise of, uh, of modern science. Uh, and there's one particular form of Christianity you haven't mentioned. Uh, I'm, uh, well, incidentally a member of that kind of tradition, yes. uh, of, of Christian. And um, I, that's just a, a topic for reflection, perhaps, uh, for later or whenever. Uh, yes, you, you, you write the post of, uh, <laughs> of the meta yes. <laughs> and development. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned, and I think Peter Harrison is of the same opinion, and mentioned origin as, uh, uh, together with Augustine, as uh, great patristic contributors to, uh, to some kind of scientific uh, uh, whatever um, endeavor. Uh, origin was far from it. Uh, he was a spiritualist, he, he didn't like the world. So <laughs> that's something. He doesn't quite fit, but he often gets credit because Neoplatonism played a role in thinking 
that helped the science of the day, and he was a key role in that. But you're all right, he was he tied in very much to the not so keen on matter, more on the spiritual mm -hmm. side, spiritual yeah. resurrection, all that. So it gets very complicated, some of these things. True. Anyway, but the true contributors in the, the Greek uh, patristic tradition have been the Cappadocians, as oh, yes. uh, uh, Yaroslav Pelikan pointed out in, I think, the 70s. Uh, he wrote a book on uh, the transformation of, uh, of ancient science and philosophy uh, by, by the Cappadocians, and uh, that, that's uh, a connection that is usually ignored. Um, and from that point on, so that's um, mid uh, fourth century or so, uh, the Greek uh, patristic tradition uh, has developed uh, a strand of thinking uh, that has uh, not ignored the sciences. On the contrary, uh, they have developed a way of thinking that somehow uh, recognized the autonomy of, uh, of the scientific undertaking, whatever that meant uh, in, in the Middle Ages, but there, there, there was research uh, done and origin, I repeat, wasn't at uh, the forefront of that kind of, of work. Uh, and uh, uh, throughout the Byzantine uh, centuries, up until the, the, almost the fall of Constantinople, uh, there have been people that were recognized as, uh, well, they were called philosophers, but were natural philosophers, as in scientists, that uh, would experiment with the vast theories. Uh, the reform of the, uh, the calendar, for instance, was predated by, by a, a Byzantine scholar um, uh, in the 14th century, but uh, because he wasn't sponsored by, by the, the government, he couldn't implement uh, the reform of the calendar, so, so forth, astronomy and, and all that. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I believe it, it's usually forgotten is that after that, uh, well, end of the classical Islamic uh, science in the 12th century, uh, there was another major moment uh, in, in the history of the West, which is the arrival of the Byzantine emigres. They had to run away from uh, Byzantium because of the Turks. Yeah? And they found refuge mainly in, in, um, uh, in Italy. Um, and they have catalyzed what we call these days the Renaissance phenomenon. Uh, and they were known uh, for their liberality in terms of, uh, of uh, free thinking, scientific inquiry and all that. Uh, to the amazement of, uh, of the locals in Italy at the time. Um, Doru, yep. I'm going to have to ask you that question. <laughs> okay. What, what's it's the question? The topic of reflection. <laughs> yeah. It's something that, you know, there's another strand of Christianity that uh, should be recuperated and included in your meta narrative and all that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Point taken to do that. There's, it's a complex story about what we're not in Christianity, so we didn't quite go into that, but the point about the Cappadocians particularly is, is a good one and well made. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my question is, your, your talk has uh, made me think whether you have thoughts or whether there are, are thoughts on that the different stages of growth are from um, uh, instigated by, by a loving Father God who takes great pleasure in humans, whether religious or anything, making discoveries about what he's created. I I didn't quite understand the question, sorry. Um, if you've had thoughts or if there are thoughts, because you, uh, for me, your talk is very much saying uh, what human effort has made in religion yeah. discoveries or in science discoveries, but it made me think of an, uh, of a, and, and the different stages of whether um, Father God is the one who is, is given the ability to grow to those different stages uh, by allowing those discoveries to be made okay, rather okay, than yeah. in human effort. Yeah, obviously I think about that, but it didn't really quite fit the paper, because the paper is meant to be a study saying what can we see based on the evidence, modeling how scientific theory about what happened in history might be formed, rather than saying uh, what did God do. So it's, it's one of those kind of things you're looking at neutrally, saying let's look at what's there. Um, there's a point at which you say, I believe this is there, and I believe there is a God who created everything. What role did this God actually actively play? Yeah. And, and, and see and, and view in this, but that's a little bit different kind of paper right. and topic. And if, and if you do that in a paper like this, it kind of weakens the argument yeah. that you're trying to make, saying this is what we can just see looking at it openly with what's there and what might not be there. That takes it to another level and say, no, maybe Christians among ourselves, other forms of monotheists might want to stop and say, so we, if we think this way and believe this way, what was God thinking and doing? How does God, how did God use all this coming together to get to a certain thing? But that's a more theological reflection rather than a historical scientific one. Okay. So you. that's why. So yeah, I, I understand the question now. Thank you. I think we have a 
about one minute to go. I've got three minutes. You've got three minutes, have you? We have one time for one short question. But my watch might be wrong. If anybody has one. I'm relying on what the captain told me on the flight from the way in and what time it is here in Sydney. Yes, we do have one short question. It is a short question. Oh, sorry. Um, we talked about uh, religion and science and so on, the beliefs in science and how they might be correlated and not cause and effect. Um, we have God in this picture. What about the, the devil himself? How has he played uh, a role in scientific thought? <laughs> They'd be bad scientists. <laughs> 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 That's another complexity of the situation. It makes it into a more theological paper and you're looking at spiritualities and saying what happened, what this and that. We're simply looking at the effect that the belief, whether that belief is so, and, and it's really written also engaging with those who don't believe that there is a God. Atheists might say, just the idea of you can see that there is one God who created everything, what would the impact of that belief have on the way you see the world, how you do science in doing that? And again, like this question, it's moving into a more theological question, which is legitimate, but for probably a different kind of paper or setting.